Greetings! The objective of this video is to provide a slow description of the work Language Models Are Few-Shot Learners, which introduced the GPT-3 model. This paper was published at NeurIPS by Brown and co-authors in 2020, where it won one of the three best paper awards given that year. Here's an overview of what will be covered. First, we will discuss the motivation for this work and provide an overview of the results. Next, we will examine the approach taken with respect to training and evaluation. We will then review results in more detail and discuss the important issue of test set contamination. We will also look at the limitations of the work and discuss the broader impacts of GPT-3 before concluding with a short summary of related work. Okay, then let's leap into the motivation and high-level overview of results. In natural language processing systems, there has been a trend towards pre-trained language representations that are increasingly flexible and task agnostic for downstream transfer. Early instrumental examples of pre-training strategies include single layer representations such as word -to vec and glove that produced word vectors that could then be transferred to a downstream task by feeding them into a task specific architecture. Building on these successes, a number of methods such as LSTM RNN autoencoders as studied by Dai et al demonstrated the benefits of contextual representations. Again, using task-specific architectures to adapt the representations to downstream tasks. More recently, methods built on transformers such as GPT and BERT have learned increasingly powerful representations that can be effectively adapted simply through fine-tuning, without the need for task-specific architectures. This transition has brought substantial gains on many NLP tasks like reading comprehension, question answering, textual entailment and others, and has led to many improved algorithm designs and architectures. However, although the architecture is task agnostic, task specific fine tuning is still required on task specific datasets, typically involving either hundreds or thousands of examples that are specific to the target task. We'd like, if at all possible, to remove this requirement for fine tuning for several reasons. The first is an obvious one, practicality. The need to collect large numbers of labelled examples directly limits the uses to which we can put language models. There are, quite simply, a very wide range of possible useful language tasks, which could run from correcting grammar, critiquing a short story, generating examples of abstract concepts, and so on. And gathering a dataset of labelled examples for each task in turn is tremendously difficult. A second drawback relates to the observation that, as models become more expressive and are trained on narrower distributions, they become more prone to exploiting spurious correlations in the training distribution. Here, there is a particular risk that a large model can pick up various forms of such correlations, such as annotation artifacts, that it can overfit to in the fine-tuning task distribution. This can lead to optimistic assessments of performance on the task, which is subsequently revealed when the model fails to generalise as it is moved slightly outside the training distribution. A third observation is that humans typically do not learn tasks by seeing large numbers of labelled examples. In many cases, a brief directive in natural language such as tell me if this sentence describes something happy or something sad, or providing a tiny number of examples, suffices for a human to do the task reasonably. Clearly, this is much more convenient. This kind of adaptability has clear practical advantages, since it allows humans to mix together various tasks and skills, such as doing some mental arithmetic in the middle of a long-running dialogue. These observations naturally prompt the question, 
how can we remove the need for fine tuning from our language models? One potential mechanism for tackling these challenges is to pursue meta-learning. In the context of language models, this means that we aim for the model to acquire a broad set of abilities during training, which it can then use to recognize or rapidly adapt to a given task at test time. In particular, we can think of the process of learning via SGD during unsupervised pre-training as the outer loop of a learning process in which a broad set of abilities are acquired. Within this outer loop, the model is tasked with generating sequences of text, and within these sequences of text, there will be subtasks to be solved, such as arithmetic, typo correction, and translation. These tasks are unlikely to occur as cleanly as presented here. Instead, they will be scattered throughout the text of the training corpus. Nevertheless, such sequences can be thought of as an inner loop in which the model learns to recognize or quickly adapt to a task during the forward pass. The authors refer to this inner loop as in-context learning to describe the process of learning to adapt to a task within the given context. And it is this ability that is leveraged for test time tasks. The interpretation we have just described is akin to classic bi-level optimization, in which the outer loop adapts the weights such that the inner loop, the activations, can be efficiently adapted for various tasks. One point to note here is that the term zero-shot transfer has also been used to describe this task in the context of language models, but this is potentially ambiguous terminology. While no gradient updates are performed on the network, it is provided with examples during inference, so it's not really learning from zero examples. For this reason, the term meta-learning is used with the intention of simply describing the structure of learning as an outer loop and an inner loop. One very important point here is that the authors intend for the name meta-learning to be agnostic to whether the task is recognized or learned during inference. It's worth noting that GPT-2 also explored what we've just described as in-context learning, using text input as a kind of task specification where the model is conditioned on a description or a few examples and then tasked with predicting what comes next. However, GPT-2 achieved just 4% on the natural questions benchmark. This is far behind the performance of OpenAI flower species and German traffic sign aficionado Alec Radford, who scored 14 on a sample of 100 questions, but probably should have got 17. Clearly, meta-learning requires very substantial improvement in order to become a practical method for problem solving across language tasks. Here, the authors note that one promising trend in recent literature has been model scaling. A progression of models from GPT with 100 million parameters, BERT with 300 million parameters, GPT-2 with 1.5 billion parameters, Megatron LM with 8 billion parameters, T5 with 11 billion parameters, and Turing NLG with 17 billion parameters have each shown improvements in NLP performance. While the work of Kaplan et al. on neural language scaling laws has shown that log loss, which often correlates pretty well with downstream task performance, improves fairly smoothly with scale. Since in-context learning requires acquisition of many skills into the model parameters, the question then arises of whether in-context learning will also similarly improve with scale. The primary focus of this work is to test the scale hypothesis by training a 175 billion parameter language model. The in-context learning abilities of this model are assessed on more than 24 NLP datasets, plus a suite of novel tasks that are unlikely to be present in the training data. The 175 billion parameter model, which is referred to as GPT-3, 
is evaluated under three settings. The first is few shot learning, which involves in context learning, in which we aim to fit as many demonstrations as possible into the model's context window, which in practice is typically in the range of 10 to 100. The second setting is one shot learning, in which only one demonstration is provided to the model. The third is zero shot learning, in which a task description is provided in natural language without any examples. While fine-tuning GPT-3 would also be possible, that regime is left for future work. We can look at the results for GPT-3 across these regimes on an example task such as removing the extraneous characters from a word. Here, we are depicting the number of examples provided as context to the model on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. The leftmost point on the x-axis corresponds to the zero-shot regime. The next represents the one-shot regime, while the remaining interval shows the few-shot regime. By increasing the model capacity up from 1.3 billion parameters to 13 billion parameters, and then again up to the 175 billion parameter GPT-3 model, we see steeper in-context learning curves, suggesting that large models exhibit a stronger ability to learn the task from context. The solid lines for each colour denote that a natural language prompt describing the task is provided to the model. The dashed lines indicate that no such prompt is used. The authors note that while the task depicted in this plot is selected as a particularly striking example, this qualitative behaviour, in which few-shot learning improves dramatically both from increased demonstrations and increased model size, is observed across most of the tasks that they study. This learning occurs simply by conditioning on additional examples. It involves no parameter updates for the model. GPT-3 achieves promising results under the regimes of zero-shot, one-shot, and few-shot learning across a range of NLP benchmarks, with notable results on benchmarks like conversational question answering and trivia question answering. GPT-3 also works well for tasks that are designed to evaluate rapid adaptation or the ability to perform on-the-fly reasoning. These include tasks such as unscrambling words, performing arithmetic, and using novel words in a sentence after seeing them used just once. It is further found that GPT-3 can synthesize, in a few-shot manner, news articles that are challenging to distinguish from those written by humans. There are also tasks where GPT-3 struggles to perform well in a few-shot setting. Examples include natural language inference tasks such as the ANLI benchmark, which comprises examples chosen adversarially, and reading comprehension on datasets such as RACE, a dataset gathered from English exams for Chinese middle school and high school children, as well as QUACK, a dataset of information-seeking dialogues. To get a broad heuristic sense of how various models perform, we can plot aggregate performance across the 42 tasks studied that measure accuracy, with the number of language model parameters on the x-axis in log scale and accuracy on the y-axis. Here, blue denotes zero-shot performance, green is one-shot and orange is few-shot. We can see that zero-shot performance in blue improves steadily with model size but that few-shot performance grows faster, suggesting that larger models may indeed be more proficient at in-context learning. We'll turn next to the approach, looking at both training and evaluation. The pre-training approach, including the model, data and training, is similar in nature to GPT-2 with the extension that a relatively straightforward scaling up of the model capacity, 
dataset size and diversity, and training length is pursued. Also similarly to GPT-2, this work considers in-context learning, but does so in a more systematic manner. For this reason, we first consider the settings under which GPT-3 could be evaluated, which lie on a spectrum according to how much task-specific data is required. Perhaps the most common evaluation for pre-trained models is fine-tuning. It involves updating the weights of a pre-trained model using a task-specific dataset for supervised training. In particular, the model is trained via repeated gradient updates using what is typically a large corpus of example tasks. So, for a slightly simplified summary of the example task of translating English to French, we are given an example input-output pair, then we perform a gradient update on the model. We are then given a second example, perform a gradient update, and so on up to the nth example and gradient update. At test time, we provide the model with a prompt containing the input in English to be translated into French. The advantage of such a fine-tuning approach is its strong performance on many benchmarks. Its disadvantages, as we've already touched on, are its requirements for a new large labelled dataset for every task, its potential for poor generalization, and specifically, its potential to exploit spurious features of the training data. This latter point, in particular, can lead to an overly optimistic assessment of the ability of a model relative to human ability on a task. In this work, GPT-3 is not fine-tuned, since the focus is instead on achieving good task-agnostic performance. However, GPT-3 can be fine-tuned in principle, and this represents a promising direction for future exploration. In contrast to fine-tuning, the few-shot setting provides a few demonstrations of the target task to the model at inference time. In the formulation considered here, the model is also typically provided with a task description. However, no gradient updates to the model are performed. Continuing with the translation from English to French task as an example, the model receives as input a description of the task together with a few examples of translations. Finally, it is prompted with an English query to produce the target translation. In general, a collection of k examples are given to the model with their corresponding completions in addition to a query example without a completion. The model is then required to produce the completion for this query. Typically, in this work, k is set to be in the range of 10 to 100, which is what is feasible to fit in the context window of 2048 for GPT-3. The advantages of FewShot are the reduced need for task-specific data and the reduced potential to learn from an overly narrow distribution. The primary disadvantage is simply that, to date, FewShot results have been much weaker than those obtained with fine-tuned models. It's worth noting that the FewShot terminology used here is related to other work that has sought to learn from few examples such as work by Hockreiter et al. on general meta-learning strategies and the one-shot matching networks of Vignoles et al. In each case, the goal is to learn on a broad distribution of tasks, which in the case of GPT-3 is implicit in the training data, then rapidly adapt to a new task. One-shot is essentially the same as few-shot, but with a single example. In particular, the model sees a task description together with a single example of the task, and, as above, no gradient updates are performed. Thus, for our running example of a translation task, the model receives a task description, an example with a completion, and the prompt containing the query example. A reason why it can be productive to distinguish one-shot from few-shot 
is that one-shot learning more closely matches the way that some tasks are communicated to humans. To take one example, it is common when describing tasks on Amazon Mechanical Turk to provide an example of the desired output. In part, this is because it is often difficult to precisely communicate a task when no examples are given. The fourth evaluation setting considered is zero shot, which provides no demonstrations at test time. Instead, the model sees only a task description and as with the few shot and one shot settings, no gradient updates are performed. Thus, for our translation task, the model receives only a task description and a prompt for which it must provide a completion. The advantages of zero shot are that it provides maximum convenience, greater potential for robustness and greater avoidance of spurious correlations unless these also arise in the pre-training corpora. In addition to weaker performance, one additional disadvantage for zero shot is that it can often be difficult to understand the task to be performed without examples. For example, a task description like make a table of world records for the 200 meter dash is highly ambiguous. What format should the table have? who exactly should be included. These are questions that can be challenging to express in the task description. However, for other tasks, zero shot is close to how humans communicate the task. In our running example of the English to French translation task, for example, a short instruction without examples likely suffices. GPT-3 uses the same model and architecture as GPT-2. In particular, it uses the same modified initialization that scales the weights of residual layers by a factor of 1 over the square root of n, where n is the number of layers, the same pre-normalization scheme that employs layer norm at the input to each subblock similar to pre-activated ResNets, and the same reversible tokenization scheme based on byte pair encoding that allows for invertible detokenization. One difference from GPT-2 is that alternating dense and locally banded sparse attention patterns are used in the layers of the transformer, in a similar manner to the sparse transformer. The authors consider a total of eight different model sizes, ranging over three orders of magnitude. Each model was trained for 300 billion tokens. The smallest model, GPT-3 small, is a 125 million parameter transformer with 12 layers. The model dimension, i.e. the bottleneck dimension, is 768. And the attention layers have 12 heads with a dimension of 64 per head. Using this model as a template, larger models are constructed, ranging from a GPT-3 medium model with 350 million parameters, a GPT large 760 million parameter model, a GPT-3 XL 1.3 billion parameter model, a model with 2.7 billion parameters, a model with 6.7 billion parameters, a GPT-3 model with 13 billion parameters, and finally, GPT-3 175B, otherwise referred to as simply GPT-3, a model with 175 billion parameters. These models are constructed by scaling the number of layers from 12 up to 96, the model dimension up from 768 to 12,288, the number of heads up to 96, and the dimension of the heads up to 128, albeit not monotonically. A few extra comments here. First, the feedforward layer dimension is always four times the model dimension, i.e. the bottleneck layer dimension. Second, all models use the same context window size of 2048 tokens. To implement training, 
the model is partitioned across GPUs along both the depth and width dimensions in order to minimize data transfer between nodes. The specific hyperparameters described here are chosen for computational efficiency and to achieve load balancing in the layout of models across GPUs. This approach was broadly inspired by the scaling laws of Kaplan et al, which suggests that with an adequate supply of training data, validation loss should scale approximately as a smooth power law as a function of model size across a fairly broad range of hyperparameter choices. Training this collection of different model sizes allows for direct testing of this scaling hypothesis, both on validation loss and on downstream language tasks. One notable recent trend in LLP has been a rapid increase in the size of datasets used for training. A prominent example of this is Common Cool, of which various subsets were considered by Rafael et al., including a variant containing nearly a trillion words. This is potentially sufficient to train even the largest GPT-3 variant without ever encountering the same sequence twice. However, it was observed that lightly filtered versions of Common Cool tend to have lower quality than datasets that have undergone a more extensive curation effort. Three steps are therefore taken to use Common Cool in a way that attains good dataset quality. The first is to filter any downloaded Common Cool data based on similarity to a collection of high quality reference data. The second is to perform fuzzy deduplication. This is done at the document level, both within datasets and across datasets, with the goal of avoiding redundancy and preserving the integrity of the held out validation set to ensure that it can be used productively to measure overfitting. The third is to directly augment the raw common pool data with high quality reference corpora, with the aim of increasing not just quality, but also diversity. The curated high quality datasets used for this augmentation are WebText2, which represents an expanded version of the WebText dataset used by GPT-2, but collected over a longer period of time, as described in the Kaplan et al. work on scaling laws. Other datasets include internet-based books corpora, which are referred to in this work as Books1 and Books2, and English Wikipedia. These dataset sources are blended together with common cool to form the training data for GPT-3. In more detail, filtered common cool data provides 410 billion tokens, which is used to supply 60% of the training mixture. This means that less than half an epoch has completed on this data by the time GPT-3 has trained for its total 300 billion tokens. To obtain this common cool data, first, 41 shards of monthly common cool are downloaded between 2016 and 2019. Filtering is applied, which reduces this 45 terabytes of compressed plain text to 570 gigabytes of filtered text. The second dataset is WebText2, which supplies 19 billion tokens and is used to provide 22% of the training mix which means that GPT-3 does almost three epochs on this data. The next datasets are Books 1 and Books 2, supplying 12 billion and 55 billion tokens respectively, and each mixed in with a weight of 8%, corresponding to 1.9 and 0.43 epochs on these sources. Finally, English Wikipedia provides the final 3 billion tokens and is mixed in with a weight of 3%, equating to 3.4 epochs through the data. It's worth noting here that during the training of GPT-3, datasets are not sampled in proportion to their size. Instead, datasets that are thought to be of higher quality are sampled more frequently, with the goal of increasing data quality 
at the expense of a small amount of overfitting. One final point to note here relates to data contamination, which is a key issue when adopting large-scale pre-training on the internet, since there is a risk that the development or test sets of downstream tasks may have been encountered during the pre-training process. This is particularly pertinent for high-capacity language models with the ability to memorize lots of content. To address this, the authors did their best to remove overlaps between the training and test sets, but some overlaps were unfortunately missed due to a bug. Since it was not feasible to retrain the model on the training data that excludes the overlaps, a different approach is taken, in which the effects of the missed overlaps on downstream performance are characterised through experiments. Let's look in a bit more detail at the steps taken to improve the quality of the common crawl data used to train GPT-3. The first step applied automatic filtering to remove low quality documents. For this, a classifier was trained to discriminate between web text as a proxy for high quality documents and raw common crawl data as a proxy for low quality documents. After training, common crawl was resampled to prioritize documents that were assessed as high quality by the classifier. The classifier itself is a logistic regressor that uses features from Spark's tokenizer and hashing TF function, which maps terms to their term frequencies. In more detail, the positive examples were collected from web text, Wikipedia, and the web books corpus. The negative examples were collected from unfiltered common crawl data. Each document was retained in the filtering process if its document score was greater than one minus a draw from the Pareto distribution with a shape parameter alpha. In order to achieve high quality but retain some diversity in the data, Alpha is set to 0.9. This value of alpha was chosen to match the classifier score distribution on web text data. It was observed that this reweighting improved the quality of a collection of out of distribution generative text samples, as measured by the model loss. The second step taken to enhance data quality, and in particular to avoid overfitting, was fuzzy deduplication. This entailed removing documents that exhibited high overlaps with other documents. The implementation of this process used Spark minhash lsh for locality sensitive hashing with 10 hashes, making use of the same collection of features that were employed for the filtering classifier. Fuzzy deduplication was also used to remove web text data from common crawl data. After completing these stages, it was found that fuzzy deduplication reduced the average dataset size by 10%. To enable efficient training of the GPT-3 models, the authors draw on a key observation from prior work that larger models can typically make efficient use of a larger batch size but often require a smaller learning rate. In particular, the gradient noise scale a statistic studied by McCandlish et al. that aims to assess the signal-to-noise ratio of gradient across training examples is measured during training. This is then used to guide the choice of batch size for each model. Returning to the eight models of different sizes introduced earlier, this strategy corresponds to selecting batch sizes that range from 0.5 million tokens up to 3.2 million tokens, and learning rates that range from 6 times 10 to the minus 4 down to 0.6 times 10 to the minus 4. To avoid running out of memory during the training process for the larger models, multiple forms of model parallelism are used, both within each matrix multiply and across the layers of the network. The training was conducted on a high bandwidth Microsoft cluster with NVIDIA V100 GPUs. For completeness, let's also run through some of the low-level optimization details. GPT-3 is trained using Adam with beta 1 equal to 0 0.9, 
beta 2 set to 0.95 and epsilon set to 10 to the minus 8. The global norm of the gradient is clipped to a value of 1. A linear learning rate warm-up is used over the first 375 million tokens and cosine decay is applied to the learning rate, bringing it down to 10% of its original value over an interval of 260 billion tokens, where it remains for the final part of training. The batch size is gradually linearly increased over the first 4 to 12 billion tokens by starting at a comparatively small batch size of 32,000 tokens, and then increasing up to the full batch size, which depends on the size of the model being trained. As is typical for such models, data are sampled without replacement within each epoch. All models also make use of decoupled weight decay with a value of 0.1. During training, the full context window of 2048 tokens is filled. This is done by packing in multiple documents into a single mega sequence for cases when documents have fewer than 2048 tokens to improve computational efficiency. When using such sequences with multiple documents, no special masking is used. Instead, multiple documents are separated with a special end of text token to inform the model that the content across document boundaries is unrelated. This has the benefit of enabling efficient training without requiring sequence specific masking. To assess performance in the few shot setting, each test sample is evaluated by sampling k examples randomly from the training set and using these to condition the model. Each example is separated by either one or two new lines, depending on the task. Datasets such as Lambada, which comprise 10,000 passages from books and tasks a model with predicting the next word in a sequence by accounting for context, and StoryClose, which comprises short stories written by Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, for which a model must guess a completion, do not have supervised training sets. So conditioning is performed on the development sets and evaluation is performed on the test sets. For the original Winograd dataset, in which a model must perform a comprehension task and choose between two possible answers, there is only one dataset. And so few shot evaluation is performed by drawing conditioning examples directly from this dataset. The value of k can be any number between 0 and the largest number of examples that will fit into the context window of 2048 tokens. Typically, it is found that larger values of k produce better results, but not always. So when a development set is available, various values of k are tried, and the best value of k is then used for the test set. In certain tasks, a natural language prompt is also provided. When it comes specifically to multiple choice tasks, the model is evaluated by conditioning on k examples and comparing the likelihood of different completions for a query example. For most tasks, this is done by simply comparing the per token likelihood in order to normalize for length. However, for a small number of datasets, such as ARC, a collection of grade school science questions, Open Book QA, a dataset that mimics open book style exam questions, and RACE, questions from English exams for Chinese middle school and high school children, it was found to be useful to perform a further normalization step. In particular, the likelihood of each completion is normalized by the unconditional probability of the completion, where the denominator here is conditioned only on an answer context string, such as the word answer, followed by a colon, or a followed by a colon. Intuitively, this should downweight answers that make for a reasonable answer, but are generic and not specific to the conditioning examples. 
For binary classification tasks, semantically meaningful names are used for the options. So, for example, true is used in place of one, and false is used in place of zero. Then, the multiple choice protocol we've just described is followed exactly as before. For tasks that require free-form text completion, beam search is used following the approach of Raffle et al with a beam width of 4 and a length penalty of alpha equal to 0.6. The model is scored using F1 similarity score, Blur score, or exact match, depending on the dataset. Finally, with regards to reporting test results, when test sets are publicly available, results are reported on the test set. For benchmarks that have private test sets, it is found that GPT-3 is often too large to fit on the test server, so results are reported on the development set instead. However, the test set is used in the small number of cases where the authors were able to get the evaluation run to completion, which includes Superglue, Trivia QA, and Pika. Next, we come to the results. We start by reporting the validation loss at different points in training for the eight models described previously, together with an additional six smaller models that go down to 100,000 parameters in scale. Here, we plot the results, where the x-axis depicts the compute used for training in petaflop per second days, the y-axis depicts cross-entropy validation loss, and the color of each line depicts the number of model parameters excluding embedding parameters. The dashed line shown here represents the power law derived in the scaling study of Kaplan et al. A few notes are in order here. First, performance appears to follow the power law quite cleanly when making efficient use of training compute. In fact, over the additional two orders of magnitude studied in this work, the departure from the scaling law appears to be minimal. Second, a natural concern might be that the improvements in cross-entropy for larger models come from simply modelling spurious details in the training corpus. However, in the results that follow, we will observe that cross-entropy improvements appear to map quite consistently to performance gains on a broad range of downstream tasks. We now turn to evaluating the models on downstream tasks, starting with language modeling on the Penn Treebank dataset, as measured via zero-shot perplexity following the T5 work of Raffel et al. Note that various tasks, such as those involving Wikipedia considered in the T5 work, are omitted from the evaluation since they are contained in the GPT-3 training data. Penn Treebank, thankfully, is not affected by these issues since it largely predates the modern internet. For this benchmark, only zero-shot perplexity is measured, since the dataset does not have a partition into splits, and as such, it is unclear how to define an appropriate few-shot evaluation. Compared to the previous state-of-the-art performance of GPT-2, which achieved a perplexity of 35.8, GPT-3 achieves a striking improvement of more than 15 points, suggesting major gains in language modelling ability. The next benchmark considered is Lambada, which requires a model to predict the last word of a sentence, where the word depends on the preceding paragraph, not just the sentence that contains it. The aim of the benchmark is therefore to test the modelling of long-range dependencies in text. For additional context, the GPT-3 authors note that it has been suggested in a recent preprint when reflecting on the minimal gains on the Lambada dataset resulting from significantly increased model size that continuing to expand hardware and data sizes by orders of magnitude is not the path forward. Comparing to the existing state of the art on Lambada, which corresponds to Turing NLG on accuracy and GPT-2 on perplexity, zero-shot GPT-3 achieves a significant boost, gaining more than 8 points in accuracy, 
and 5.6 points in perplexity, suggesting that a simple scaling up strategy does appear to yield major gains. Lambada also demonstrates the benefits of few-shot learning as a technique to tackle a particular problem that can occur with this dataset. The problem is that although the completion in Lambada is always the last word in the sentence, a traditional language model is unaware of this fact and has no way to make use of this information. As a result, it assigns probability to any valid continuations of the paragraph in addition to one-word completions. One partial solution, explored in prior work, is to use stop word filters, which simply ban a list of continuation words. However, with few-shot learning, we can frame the task as a closed test to communicate to the model that exactly one word is required. Let's make this idea a bit more concrete with an example. Our supervised example is, Alice was friends with Bob. Alice went to visit her friend blank, full stop, followed by an arrow pointing to Bob. To perform the task on a test sample, we then provide the model with a prompt such as George bought some baseball equipment, a ball, a glove and a blank, and require it to provide a completion after the arrow. It is found that this approach significantly improves the performance of GPT-3 such that in the few shot setting, the accuracy rises to 86.4, the perplexity falls to 1.92. We also observe that performance on Lambada scales fairly consistently with model size. Here, we are plotting the parameters in the language model on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. The lower dashed gray bar depicts the previous zero shot state of the art and the upper grey dashed bar depicts human performance. The blue line denotes zero shot, the green line denotes one shot, and the orange line denotes few shot performance. Few shot seems to be most effective for the larger models, and in fact hurts the smaller models. It's also notable that this fill in the blank method is not effective in a one shot setting, where GPT-3 attains 72.5 accuracy and 3.35 perplexity, falling below its zero-shot performance. The authors suggest that this may be because several examples are required for the model to learn the closed pattern. The next benchmarks evaluate the ability of the model to perform completion. Hellaswag tasks models with selecting the best ending to a story or set of instructions. Here the dataset samples have been adversarially mined in order to make the task difficult for machines. However, these samples remain relatively easy for humans, who attain above 95% on the benchmark. The state of the art on this task at the time of writing was 85.6, which was set by a Roberta Large Alum model with fine-tuning. GPT-3 Zero Shot performs reasonably, but its score of 78.9 is some way off the alum model. One-shot performance is slightly weaker, attaining 78.1, while few-shot GPT-3 gets a marginal boost up to 79.3, still far from the state of the art. A related completion assessment is provided by StoryClose, which tasks models with selecting the end sentence for five-sentence stories. On this benchmark, the fine-tuned state-of-the-art is 91.8, attained by Transpert. Zero-shot GPT-3 scores 83.2, one-shot GPT-3 scores 84.7, and few-shot GPT-3 scores 87.7, which indicates solid performance, but still short of the state-of-the-art. Note, however, that the GPT-3 results do represent an improvement of 10% over the best previous zero-shot results. Our next benchmarks focus on assessing the ability of GPT-3 to answer questions about factual knowledge. Since there are so many possible questions about factual knowledge, 
that can be asked of a model, this scenario has typically been approached in an open book manner, in which an information retrieval system is combined with a model that generates an answer for the question by conditioning on the retrieved text. However, the work of Robert et al. showed that large language models such as T5 can be coaxed via fine-tuning into achieving good performance in a closed book setting without conditioning on auxiliary information. Their work also suggests that further increasing the capacity of the language model would yield improved performance in the closed book setting. The high capacity of GPT-3 offers an opportunity to test this hypothesis. To this end, GPT-3 is evaluated on natural questions, web questions, and trivia QA. Note that this is again done in the zero-shot, one-shot, and few-shot settings, which are stricter than prior work, which makes use of fine-tuning. On natural questions, the state-of-the-art performance in the open book setting is 44.5, set by RAG, which is short for Retrieval Augmented Generation. A fine-tuned T5 model making use of salient span masking, or SSM, during pre-training, which is found to improve question answering, attains 36.6, while a T5 model without this pre-training objective attains 34.5. Zero-shot GPT-3 scores 14.6, one-shot GPT-3 scores 23.0, and few-shot GPT-3 scores 29.9. The GPT-3 authors note here that the large gain in few-shot performance above zero-shot performance may hint at distribution shift, particularly since the questions in the natural questions dataset tend to require very fine-grained knowledge on Wikipedia, testing the limits of GPT-3's capacity and broad pre-training distribution. On web questions, the open book state of the art is 45.5. Fine tuned T5 with SSM comes close to this in a closed book setting with 44.7, while T5 without SSM scores 37.4. Of this dataset, zero shot GPT 3 scores 14.4, one shot GPT 3 scores 25.3, and few shot GPT 3 scores 41.5, suggesting that, as with natural questions, this style of question answering is slightly out of distribution for GPT-3, but that it is able to make the adaptation to some extent within context learning. Finally, turning to Trivia QA, where RAG attains 68 in the open book setting, Fine-tuned T5 with SSM pre-training scores 60.5 in the closed book setting, and T5 without SSM scores 50.1. Here, GPT-3 is much stronger, scoring 64.3 in the zero-shot scenario, while GPT-3 one-shot scores 68.0, matching RAG, and few-shot GPT-3 scores 71.2 going beyond the open book state of the art. It can also be instructive to look at the influence of model capacity for this task. For this, we can plot the performance of GPT-3 on the Trivia QA benchmark with the number of parameters on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. The blue line denotes zero-shot performance. The green line denotes one-shot performance and the orange line denotes few-shot performance with 64 shots. The grey dashed line denotes the previous fine-tuned open book state-of-the-art RAG. One notable trend here is how smoothly performance improves with model capacity, suggesting that increased capacity may allow more knowledge to be packed into the parameters of the model. While the precise numbers change slightly, a similar trend where performance increases with capacity is also observed on the web questions and natural questions datasets, suggesting that this scaling phenomenon may hold across a somewhat broad range of knowledge-based question-answering tasks. The next assessments look at translationability 
between languages. For context here, it's useful to note that the training dataset of GPT-2, the previous generation of the model, was filtered to include only English, due to concerns about capacity. Despite this, GPT-2 nevertheless demonstrated non-trivial translation ability between French and English, in spite of the fact that it had seen just 10 megabytes of French text. Given the increased capacity of GPT-3, the authors opt to increase the representation of other languages, although they note that this is an area for improvement and that the training set is still dominated by English as a consequence of how the data was sourced and filtered from common gruel. By word count, the training corpus for GPT-3 is approximately 93% English and 7% other languages. As further background, it's useful to note that there has been significant work on unsupervised machine translation, which often combines pre-training on monolingual datasets with back translation to bridge the languages. By contrast, GPT-3 learns from blended training data by mixing languages at the word, sentence and document level using a single training objective. One extra point to note here is that the one-shot and few-shot performance of GPT-3 is not directly comparable to previous work on unsupervised translation since it makes use of a small amount of paired examples, in this case either 1 or 64, corresponding to up to one or two pages of in-context training data. Turning to the results, we examine performance on English to French, French to English, English to German, German to English, English to Romanian and Romanian to English. For this, Experiments are conducted on WMT-14 between French and English, WMT-16 between German and English, and WMT-16 between Romanian and English. For context, we can begin by noting the supervised state-of-the-art performance in blur scores on each of these tasks, which are set by a range of different methods. The numbers highlighted in bold represent scores that the GPT-3 authors are relatively confident represent the state of the art at the time of writing, while non-bold numbers were the best results that they could find, but they note that they seem suspiciously low, and therefore should be taken with a grain of salt. Next, we report numbers for several unsupervised machine translation methods, namely XLM, MASS, and MBART. We find that zero-shot GPT-3 underperforms existing unsupervised methods on every task. Providing a single example to GPT-3 brings a strong boost of 7 blur on average, and moving to the few-shot regime brings a further 4 blur on average, making GPT-3 competitive with unsupervised approaches. One noticeable trend is that the direction of translation makes a big difference to performance. When translating into English from French, German and Romanian, GPT-3 healthily outperforms unsupervised approaches. However, when translating the other way, i.e. English into French, English into German and English into Romanian, GPT-3 falls behind unsupervised methods. This last result of English to Romanian translation appears to be something of an outlier that falls more than 10 blur behind unsupervised methods, which the GPT-3 authors note could be related to their reuse of the byte-level BPE tokenizer of GPT-2 that was developed on an almost fully English corpus. The results from French into English and German into English, appear to outperform the supervised state-of-the-art, but due to their lack of familiarity with the literature, the authors note that these may not be a comparison to the true state-of-the-art. They were, however, as noted previously, the best results they could find. For the Romanian into English translation, few-shot GPT-3 is very close to the supervised state-of-the-art. Next, 
we can look at the influence of scale for this task. Here we have a plot for various language pairs, with the number of parameters in the language model on the x-axis and Blur score on the y-axis. The dashed lines represent translations out of English and into French in blue, German in green and Romanian in red, where in each case GPT-3 struggles. The solid lines represent pairs with translations into English, again with French in blue, German in green and Romanian in red. In these directions, we see that GPT-3 performs much more strongly. Perhaps more importantly though, the main takeaway of this figure is that we again observe smooth gains with increased model capacity across the translation tasks. Winograd schemas, as introduced by Levesque et al, are an NLP task that requires the participant to determine which word a pronoun refers to. The task is designed such that the pronoun is grammatically ambiguous, but semantically unambiguous for a human. For example, given the statement, the trophy doesn't fit in the brown suitcase because it's too big, what is too big? The participant must choose between answer 0, the trophy, and answer 1, the suitcase. From the meaning of the sentence, it's clear that the correct answer here is answer 0, the trophy. However, suppose we swap the special word big for an alternate word small. So the statement now reads, the trophy doesn't fit in the brown suitcase because it's too small. What is too small? We observe that now, answer 1, the suitcase, is correct. This kind of construction makes it more challenging to solve the task based on word order or particular groups of words, since they are held constant across the two cases. GPT-3 is evaluated on the original 273 Winograd schemes, using the partial evaluation method introduced by Trin et al, and also used by GPT-2. This partial evaluation method uses the language model to score the conditional probability of the part of the sentence after the pronoun, once the pronoun has been replaced with the candidate answers. The setting is slightly different to the WSC task included in the Superglue benchmark, which also considers the task as binary classification, but requires entity extraction to convert it to a form where partial evaluation can be performed. In addition to the original Winograd schemas, performance is also reported on the more challenging, adversarially mined Winograd dataset. For the results, we first note that the fine-tuned state-of-the-art on Winograd at the time of writing was 90.1, which was achieved via fine-tuning a Roberta model on Winograd. On the Winograd dataset, the fine-tuned state-of-the-art is 84.6, which is achieved by casting the problem as natural language inference and applying T5 to the task. On the first challenge, GPT-3 scores 88.3 in a zero-shot setting, 89.7 in a one-shot setting, and 88.6 in a few-shot setting. In all cases, the performance is very strong, but we do not observe any in-context learning in action, since performance is similar across the three settings. Note that these results are marked with an asterisk, since GPT-3 authors found that there was a small amount of contamination that affects this test set, though thanks to their analysis of this issue, they do not believe that it dramatically changes the results. On Winograd, zero-shot GPT-3 scores 70.2, one-shot GPT-3 scores 73.2, and few-shot GPT-3 scores 77.7. Here, there is a larger gap to the state of the art, but we do observe clear gains from in-context learning. Turning to the influence of model scale on this task, we plot performance on Winograd with the number of parameters in the language model on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. 
The dashed grey horizontal lines represent random guessing, fine-tuned Bert Large, fine-tuned Roberta Large, the fine-tuned state of the art based on T5, and finally, an estimate of human performance. The blue line denotes zero-shot GPT-3 performance, the green line denotes one shot, and the orange line denotes few shot, with K equals 50 shots. As before, the trend continues with smooth gains achieved by increasing model capacity. We next turn to assessing GPT-3 on common sense reasoning tasks. Several datasets have been proposed to assess physical or scientific reasoning, as opposed to focusing on skills such as sentence completion, reading comprehension, or question answering across broad domains of knowledge. The first is Physical Interaction Question Answering, or PICA, which asks common sense questions about how the physical world works. The second is the AI2 Reasoning Challenge, ARC, which consists of questions from 3rd to ninth grade science exams. The third is Open Book Question Answering, or Open Book QA, which consists of questions generated by Amazon Mechanical Turkers from Elementary Science Facts. On Pika, the GPT-3 authors report that the fine-tuned state-of-the-art is 79.4, achieved by a fine-tuned Roberta model. Zero-shot GPT-3 scores 80.5, one-shot GPT-3 also scores 80.5, and few-shot GPT-3 scores 82.8, with this last result evaluated on the official test server. Note that as with the Winograd schemas, these results are marked with an asterisk to denote that some potential dataset contamination was discovered. For the ARC benchmark on the easy version of the dataset, which has not undergone filtering, the fine-tuned state-of-the-art is 92.0, set by Unified QA. Here, GPT-3 scores 68.8 zero-shot, 71.2 one-shot, and 70.1 few-shot. On the challenge version of the benchmark, which was filtered to remove questions that can be answered with simple statistics or information retrieval, the state of the art is 78.5, also set by Unified QA. GPT-3 scores 51.4 zero shot, 53.2 one shot, and 51.5 few shot. In both arc variants, we observe that GPT-3 falls quite a long way behind the fine-tuned state-of-the-art and benefits little from in-context learning. Finally, on the Open Book QA benchmark, where the fine-tuned state-of-the-art is 87.2, again set by Unified QA, GPT-3 scores 57.6 zero-shot, 58.8 one-shot, and 65.4 few-shot. Here again, GPT-3 is far behind the state of the art, but does benefit considerably from in-context learning. Returning to the influence of model scale, this plot depicts performance on the open book QA benchmark, with the number of parameters in the language model on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. The grey dashed line shows the fine-tuned state of the art set by Unified QA. We show zero-shot performance in blue, one-shot performance in green, and few-shot performance with k equals 100 in orange. On this common-sense reasoning task, we observe relatively smooth, though not quite monotonic, gains in performance with increased model capacity. In order to assess GPT-3 for the task of reading comprehension, five datasets are used which include questions in both single round and dialogue format, as well as answers that are abstractive, multiple choice, and span-based. The first dataset is Conversational Question Answering, or COCA, a collection of 127,000 conversation turns in which almost half of the questions refer back to conversational history. The second is Discrete Reasoning Over Paragraphs, or DROP, a set of 96,000 crowdsourced, 
adversarially created questions that require a model to resolve references in a paragraph, then perform discrete reasoning tasks like counting or sorting in order to answer questions about them. The third is question answering in context, or quack, which consists of 14,000 dialogues between a pair of crowd workers, one of whom is interrogating the other in order to learn about a hidden passage of text. The fourth is squad, with adversarial, unanswerable questions, originally referred to as squadron, but now more widely known as squad v2 or squad 2.0, which complements the original squad dataset with 50,000 additional unanswerable questions that have been written adversarially by crowd workers such that they appear to be answerable. The goal here is to evaluate the ability of models to determine when no answer is appropriate to a question about a given passage. The final dataset is reading comprehension dataset from examinations, or RACE, which contains 100,000 English exam questions written for Chinese school children between the ages of 12 and 18. On COCA, the fine-tuned state of the art at the time of writing was 90.7 F1 score, set by fine-tuning a Roberta model with adversarial training and knowledge distillation. GPT-3 attains 81.5 zero shot, while GPT-3 one shot achieves 84, and GPT-3 few shot achieves 85. Overall, GPT-3 performs solidly on this benchmark and sees a medium-sized gain in the few-shot scenario, pushing it to within three points of a human baseline. On drop, the fine-tuned state-of-the-art was 89.1 F1 score at the time of writing, attained by Numeric Transformer. Here, GPT-3 scores 23.6 in the zero-shot setting, rising to 34.3 one shot and 36.5 few shot. The overall performance is relatively weak, suggesting that the model struggles to perform discrete reasoning over paragraphs, but it does achieve a big gain from few shot learning, allowing it to outperform the fine tuned BERT baseline from the original paper. On Quack, the fine tuned state of the art was 74.4 F1 set by a leaderboard submission called TRMT Ensemble from WeChat AI in 2019. On these information-seeking question-answering dialogues, GPT-3 attains 41.5 zero-shot, 43.3 one-shot, and 44.3 few-shot. Here, GPT-3 is also weak, falling far behind the fine-tuned state-of-the-art, and 13 F1 below an ELMO baseline. It also sees little benefit from few shot learning. On Squad V2, the fine tuned state of the art at the time of writing was 93 F1, set by an ensembled SA net based on Albert. GPT 3 scores 59.5 zero shot, 65.4 one shot, and 69.8 few shot. The overall performance here is medium. There remains a major gap to the state of the art, but there is also a big jump from few shot learning, allowing it to outperform the fine tuned baseline in the original paper. On the race benchmark partition of exam questions for high school students, denoted race H, and the partition for middle school students, denoted race M, the fine-tuned state of the art at the time of writing was 90% and 93.1% accuracy respectively, both set by Megatron LM. On both partitions, GPT-3 performs comparatively weakly and sees little to no gain from few-shot learning, which in fact slightly harms performance on race M. From the perspective of model scale, this figure illustrates performance on the COCA benchmark, with the x-axis depicting the number of parameters in the language model, and F1 score on the y-axis. The first grey dashed line 
illustrates an estimate of human performance on the benchmark, while the second shows the fine-tuned state-of-the-art set using a Roberta model. We depict zero-shot performance in blue, one-shot performance in green, and few-shot performance with k equals 5 in orange. Here again, we see the pattern of smooth gains in performance with increased model capacity. Next, GPT-3 is evaluated on the SuperGlue benchmark, which provides an aggregate assessment of a range of NLP abilities. This benchmark comprises eight tasks. The first is Boolean questions, or BoolQ, a collection of yes-no questions about passages of text that are naturally occurring in the sense that they were sourced from Google search engine user queries and then paired up later with paragraphs from Wikipedia. Commitment Bank, or CB, is a collection of texts containing embedded clauses that have been annotated with the apparent level of commitment of the author to the truth of the clause. Choice of Plausible Alternatives, or COPA, requires the model to perform a binary selection among two choices to determine which is more plausible for either the cause or effect of a premise. Multi-sentence reading comprehension, or multi-RC, tasks a model with answering a question about a paragraph when provided with a set of candidate answers, multiple of which can be true. Reading comprehension with common sense reasoning dataset, or record, consists of multiple choice close style questions covering news passages. Recognizing textual entailment, or RTE, adopts the same data as used in the original GLUE benchmark, merging data from the annual competitions of RTE 1, 2, 3 and 5, and converting these into two-class classification in which a model is tasked with choosing between entailment and not entailment. Word in Context, or WIC, requires a model to determine whether a polysemous word is used in the same sense in two given sentences. Finally, Winograd Schema Challenge, or WSC, tasks a model with co-reference resolution as binary classification. To evaluate in a few-shot setting, 32 examples are used for each task by sampling them from the training set. One low-level detail here is that for every dataset except WSC and MultiRC, different examples are used as context for each separate problem. But for these two datasets, the same examples are used as context. Turning to the results, we can look at the overall average for the SuperGlue benchmark, together with accuracy on BoolQ, accuracy and F1 on CB, accuracy on COPA, accuracy on RTE, accuracy on WIC, accuracy on WSC, accuracy and F1A score, which represents F1 over all answer options on multi-RC, and accuracy and F1 score on record. To provide context for the results, we first report fine-tuned state-of-the-art across the benchmark and fine-tuned BERT large performance in addition to GPT-3 few-shot performance. We can make a few observations here. On COPA, where GPT-3 scores 92, and on record, where GPT-3 scores 90.2 accuracy and 91.1 .1 F1, performance is only a few percentage points behind the existing fine-tuned state-of-the-art. On WSC, GPT-3 scores 80.1, which is a solid score, considerably outperforming fine-tuned BERT Large, which scores 64.6. GPT-3 scores 76.4 on BoolQ, 69 on RTE, and 30.5 accuracy, 75.4 F1A on multi-RC. By comparing to the results in the line above, we can see that for these benchmarks, GPT-3 is comparable to fine-tuned BERT. On CB, GPT-3 achieves 75.6 accuracy and 52 F1, 
falling behind the scores of 83.6 and 75.7 set by fine-tuned BERT. The authors describe this performance as showing signs of life. It's doing something reasonable, but has significant room for improvement. Finally, the accuracy of 49.4 set on WIC is a clear point of weakness for GPT-3, both when comparing to the 69.6 set by fine-tuned BERT, and when considering that this is essentially random chance performance, which corresponds to 50% accuracy. Here, the authors note that their efforts to rephrase or reformulate the WIC word sense disambiguation task were unsuccessful. This reflects a broader trend in which one-shot and few-shot GPT-3 appears to be relatively weak at comparing two sentences or snippets. One example of this is when checking if a word is used in the same sense in two sentences, as is the case for the WIC task. But other related examples of weak performance include the task of checking if one sentence paraphrases another or if one sentence implies another. This trend is also reflected in the relatively weak performance of GPT-3 on the RTE and CB tasks that adopt a similar format. Nevertheless, overall results are encouraging. Of the eight tasks in the benchmark, GPT-3 is near to the fine-tuned state-of-the-art on two tasks and stronger than fine-tuned but large on four tasks. Returning to the influence of how model scale affects performance, here we show performance on superglue with the number of parameters in the language model in billions on the x-axis and aggregate superglue score on the y-axis. The grey horizontal dashed lines depict random guessing, fine-tuned BERT large, fine-tuned BERT++, fine-tuned state-of-the-art and human performance. The blue line denotes zero-shot GPT-3, while the green line denotes one-shot and the orange line denotes few-shot, with k equals 32 shots. One point to note is that the grey dashed lines are test set scores, while the coloured GPT-3 lines are dev set scores, so they are not directly comparable, but are simply used to provide context. We observe relatively smooth, close to monotonic, gains with increased model capacity. We can also examine the influence of the number of examples provided in context on few-shot performance for the largest model. Here we have the number of examples in context on the x-axis and superglue score on the y-axis. As before, the grey dashed horizontal lines depict random guessing, fine-tuned BERT large, fine-tuned BERT++, the fine-tuned state-of-the-art, and human performance. The orange line shows the performance of the GPT-3 175 billion parameter model in a few-shot evaluation setting. Here we see relatively smooth gains with increased context size, up to 32 examples, after which it becomes difficult to reliably fit more examples into the context. The goal of Natural Language Inference, or NLI, benchmarks is to assess the ability of models to infer relationships between two sentences. The standard formulation of this task involves either two-way or three-way classification for whether the second sentence either logically follows, contradicts, or is neutral with respect to the first sentence. On the RTE component of the superglue benchmark we just looked at, only the largest GPT-3 model performed much better than random. However, this model, when evaluated few-shot, was able to achieve performance comparable to a fine-tuned BERT large baseline. To better understand how GPT-3 fares on the NLI task, an additional evaluation is conducted on the Adversarial Natural Language Inference, or ANLI, dataset which includes adversarially mined natural language inference questions obtained through three increasingly challenging rounds of question mining. Here, we plot the results on the third and most challenging round of ANLI problems for different model sizes, 
with the number of parameters in the language model on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. The grey dashed horizontal lines denote random guessing, fine-tuned Bert Large, fine-tuned Roberta Large and the fine-tuned state of the art. The coloured lines denote zero-shot, one-shot and few-shot performance for GPT-3 with k equals 50 shots. One point to note here is that the dev set is used for evaluation. This set only contains 1500 examples and therefore can exhibit high variance. The authors estimate this directly, finding a standard deviation of 1.2%, which is unlikely to meaningfully change the conclusions of the experiment. We observe that all model sizes, less than 175 billion parameters, perform essentially at chance level, demonstrating no ability to tackle these problems. However, the few shot 175 billion parameter model shows promising signs that it has learned something of the task, though there is clearly a long way to go. When taken together with the weak results on the RTE task in Superglue, this finding suggests that natural language inference remains a very challenging problem for current language models. In order to evaluate the capabilities of GPT-3 more broadly, the authors explore the use of synthetic tasks to probe its ability to perform simple, on-the-fly reasoning, recognise novel patterns that it would probably not have seen during training, and adapt quickly to unusual tasks. In this spirit, a suite of 10 tasks were devised to assess GPT-3's ability to perform arithmetic without receiving task-specific training. These tasks were two-digit addition, in which two integers are sampled uniformly between 0 and 100, and phrased as a question such as Q, what is 32 plus 12, A, 46? Other tasks include three-digit addition, which samples two integers between 0 and 1000, four-digit addition, which samples two integers between 0 and 10,000, and five-digit addition, which samples two integers between 0 and 100,000. The next task is two-digit subtraction, which subtracts one integer sampled uniformly between 0 and 100 from another. As an example, it could take the form Q, what is 34 minus 12? A, 22. Analogously to addition, we define three-digit, four-digit, and five-digit subtraction. The ninth task is two-digit multiplication, which requires the model to multiply two integers sampled between 0 and 100. For example, Q, what is 24 times 42? A, 1008. The final task is one-digit composite, in which three integers are sampled between 0 and 10, and then a composite operation is used involving two operators randomly sampled from among addition, subtraction, and multiplication, and then grouped with parentheses. For example, Q, what is 6 plus 4 times 8? A, 38. For each of these 10 tasks, 2,000 random instances are generated. One point to note here is that, when evaluating, the answers produced by the model must be exactly correct to be counted as correct. Here we plot the results for few-shot arithmetic at different model sizes, with the number of parameters in the language model on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. The coloured lines represent the tasks for two-digit, three-digit, four-digit and five-digit addition and subtraction as well as two-digit multiplication and the one-digit composite operation. For two-digit addition, the largest GPT-3 model attains 100% accuracy, with performance dropping as more digits are involved for the addition and subtraction tasks. However, the largest model still achieves non-trivial performance for five-digit operations, attaining between 9 and 10% accuracy. For the computationally heavy task of two-digit multiplication, GPT-3 scores 29.2% accuracy. For the one-digit composite task, GPT-3 scores 21.3%, with 
suggesting some partial ability to go beyond single arithmetic operations. We also see that model scale appears to be particularly critical for these arithmetic tasks. The 13 billion parameter model performed significantly worse than the 175 billion parameter model, achieving only about 50% accuracy on the two-digit addition and subtraction tasks. We can also look at the arithmetic results for the largest GPT-3 model across these 10 tasks in the zero-shot, one-shot, and few-shot settings. By comparing few-shot performance with zero-shot and one-shot, we can see that performance is degraded considerably for zero-shot and one-shot, suggesting that some kind of few-shot adaptation or task recognition is taking place. However, GPT-3 zero-shot is still performing reasonably, and considerably better than the few-shot results with the 13 billion parameter model. Given these results, one question that naturally arises is whether GPT-3 is simply memorising the arithmetic problems from training data. To check for this kind of memorization, the authors search the training corpus for each of their three-digit problems in the form num1 add num2 equals and num1 plus num2 equals. With this search, it was found that there were 17 matches out of 2,000 queries for addition problems, corresponding to 0.8% of the problems, and two matches out of 2,000 queries for subtraction problems, corresponding to 0.1% of the problems. Consequently, it seems unlikely that memorization is the cause of GPT-3's performance. Interestingly, it was also found by examining failure cases that GPT-3 can make mistakes that correspond to not carrying a 1, suggesting that it may be attempting computation rather than memory-based lookup. A high-level takeaway from these experiments is that GPT-3 demonstrates some ability at arithmetic, particularly in the few-shot setting. The next task focus on character manipulation with the goal of assessing GPT-3's capability to learn novel symbolic manipulation from a handful of examples. Five such tasks are designed, each of which provides the model with a word that has been distorted in some way, then requires it to recover the original word. In each case, the task provides examples as prompts in the form new line and then the distorted word equals, and the model is required to provide a completion that produces the original, undistorted word. The tasks include cycle letters in a word, or CL, where the distorted word is a word with its letters cycled and the model must recover the original. For example, given the character sequence Li Inevitab, the model should output inevitably. The second task is anagrams of all but the first and last characters, or a1, in which the distorted word has every letter except the first and last randomly scrambled. For example, the input could be creoptuon, and the desired output is corruption. The third task comprises anagrams of all but the first and last two characters, or A2, in which the distorted word has every letter except the first two and last two randomly scrambled. For example, the input could be opponent, and the desired output is opponent. The fourth task is random insertion in word, or RI, in which the distorted word has random punctuation and space inserted between each letter. For example, this distorted variant of succession would be provided as input, and the model should simply return succession as output. Finally, the fifth task is reversed words, in which the distorted word is spelt backwards. For example, given the input stekjabo, the model should produce objects as output. To construct the examples, the top 10,000 most frequent English words, as estimated by Norvig's analysis of the Google trillion word corpus, whose length lies between 4 and 15 characters, are used to generate 10,000 examples for each of the five tasks. One extra note here is that the tasks CL, A1 and A2 are not bijective, 
in the sense that the target word is not a deterministic function of the distorted word. And thus the model is required to perform some form of search in order to solve the task. Here we plot the results for the word scramble tasks with the number of parameters in the language model on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. The blue line denotes the cycle letters task. Orange denotes anagrams of all but the first and last characters. Green denotes anagrams of all but the first two and last two characters. Red denotes random insertion and purple denotes reversed words. Overall, we observe monotonic gains in performance with increased model size. Interestingly, we see that no model, including the 175 billion parameter model, is able to perform the word reversal task in any meaningful way. We can also compare the performance of the 175 billion parameter model across the five tasks in the zero shot, one shot, and few shot settings. We observe a major drop in performance moving from few shot to one shot, and again from one shot to zero shot, suggesting that the model may be learning these tasks at test time, since it is unlikely that the tasks appear in the training data. Relatedly, it is also found that performance rapidly increases with the number of additional examples provided to the model, particularly for the 175 billion parameter variant. One additional point worth noting here is that the byte pair encoding used by GPT-3 operates on large fractions of words, approximately 0.7 words per token on average, rather than on characters. As a result, solving these tasks therefore requires the model to understand and pull apart the substructure of BPE tokens. The next evaluation considers SAT analogy problems which present a task that is slightly unusual relative to the common distribution of internet text. In SAT analogies, a student is provided with a partial statement like audaciousness is to boldness as, and they are then provided with five candidate answers. In this case, sanctimonious is to hypocrisy, anonymous is to identity, remorseful is to misdeed, deleterious is to result, and impressionable is to temptation. Among these, they must select the best fit, which, in this case, is sanctimonious is to hypocrisy. GPT-3 is tested on a collection of 374 such questions that were obtained from preparation books and websites for students planning to take the SAT exam, curated by Turney et al. As a point of reference, assuming that these problems are representative, Turney et al. observed that the average college-bound senior high school student would answer about 57% of the problems correctly. Here we show the influence of GPT-3 model size on SAT analogy performance, with the number of parameters in the language model on the x-axis and accuracy on the y-axis. The horizontal dashed grey line illustrates the score achieved by random guessing. The blue line represents zero shot performance. The green line represents one shot and the orange line is few shot with k equals 20 shots. For this task, we observe relatively smooth gains in performance with increased model capacity. We also see that the largest model with 175 billion parameters appears to benefit more from seeing additional examples, suggesting the presence of effective in-context learning. This effect is not observed for the smaller models. We next look at news article generation. Previous work evaluated the capabilities of GPT-2 for the task of synthesizing news articles via prompting in which the model was provided with a plausible first sentence for a news story. However, when comparing to GPT-2 training, the GPT-3 training corpus is much less heavily skewed towards news content. As a result, it is found that generating news articles from headlines is less effective. In particular, GPT-3 will often interpret the first sentence as a tweet, 
then respond with a series of follow-up tweets. To tackle this issue, the GPT-3 authors use the few-shot functionality of the model and provide three previous news articles as conditioning context via the prompt. With such context, when given a title and a subtitle of a proposed news article, GPT-3 is able to reliably synthesise short news stories. To assess the standard to which GPT-3 is able to generate news articles, the authors measure the ability of humans to distinguish real articles from fake articles generated by the model. Such studies have also been considered in prior work by Zellers et al. and Kreps et al., who sought to probe, amongst other things, some of the political consequences of such an ability. Since GPT-3 aims to match the distribution of human-generated content, this human test can be viewed as a useful assessment of text generation quality. For this evaluation, 25 article titles and subtitles were selected arbitrarily from Newser.com, a news aggregation website with average article lengths of 215 words. Articles were then generated using four different GPT-3 models, with sizes ranging from 125 million parameters up to 175 billion parameters, with an average article length of 200 words. For each of these four models, approximately 80 US-based human participants were shown the real titles and subtitles, and then either the original article or a generated article. They were then asked to select which of the following five options was most appropriate. The article was very likely written by a human, most likely written by a human, I don't know, most likely written by a machine, or very likely written by a machine. A few extra details about this study. First, the selected articles were not in the training data for GPT-3, and the articles generated by the model were both formatted and selected in an automatic manner, programmatically, in order to minimise the influence of human cherry-picking. For each model, the same context consisting of three previous articles together with the candidate title and subtitle was provided. To control for participant attention and effort, a control baseline was also included that produced intentionally bad articles using a 160 million parameter model with no context and additional output randomness. We now come to the results, starting with our deliberately bad control model. For these articles, the participants correctly solved the task 86% of the time, where accuracy is defined as the ratio of correct assignments to non-neutral assignments per participant. Moving to GPT-3 small, human accuracy at distinguishing fake articles drops to 76%. As model capacity increases, human accuracy falls until finally, for the largest GPT-3 175 billion parameter model, human accuracy is barely above random guessing, at just 52%. In addition to mean accuracy, we can also inspect the 95% confidence intervals around these accuracies, which is at most 8 percentage points and is as low as 5 percentage points. Comparing to the control baseline under a two-sample t-test for the difference in mean accuracy suggests that we can be fairly statistically confident that there is a meaningful difference between the models. Finally, the number of I don't know assignments from participants varies for different models, but remains under 10% in all cases. The broader takeaway here is that larger models produce news articles that are harder to distinguish. It's perhaps worth noting that prior work by Ippolito et al. suggests that it may be the case that automatic methods like Grover and GLTR may be better able to detect generated text than humans. Consequently, such systems may represent a promising direction for future research. To get a better handle on the results of this study, 
we can visualize the performance of humans in detecting generated news articles with the number of parameters in the language model in log scale on the x-axis and human accuracy on the y-axis. The lower horizontal gray dashed line represents chance performance, in which humans cannot distinguish at all between real and generated news articles, while the top line represents performance for the intentionally weak control model, for which humans can detect generated articles with 86% accuracy. The line of best fit, shown here, is a power law with 95% confidence intervals. Overall, the plot repeats the point made previously that articles generated by larger models are harder for humans to detect. It can also be informative to consider the average time spent trying to detect whether each article was human written or generated by a model. Here again, we have the number of parameters in the language model on the x-axis and the average duration in seconds spent on each article on the y-axis. The horizontal grey dashed line here represents the control model, for which the average time spent by humans was 105 seconds. Here, the plotted line of best fit is a linear model on a log scale with 95% confidence intervals. The takeaway here is that humans spend more time judging the articles generated by larger models, reinforcing the finding of the plot on the left in suggesting that these articles are more challenging to discern. We can look at some of the articles generated by GPT-3 to get a better sense of their quality. The first one we'll look at is the one that the humans had the most difficulty in distinguishing from a real article, scoring just 12% accuracy at this task. In addition to three previous articles of context, the model was given the title United Methodists Agree to Historic Split, the subtitle those who oppose gay marriage will form their own denomination. Then, given the remaining prompt word article, followed by a colon, GPT-3 produced the following. After two days of intense debate, the United Methodist Church has agreed to a historic split, one that is expected to end in the creation of a new denomination, one that will be theologically and socially conservative, according to the Washington Post. The majority of delegates attending the church's annual general conference in May voted to strengthen a ban on the ordination of LGBTQ clergy and to write new rules that will discipline clergy who officiate at same-sex weddings. But those who opposed these measures have a new plan. They say they will form a separate denomination by 2020, calling their church the Christian Methodist denomination. The Post notes that the denomination, which claims 12.5 million members, was, in the early 20th century, the largest Protestant denomination in the US, but that it has been shrinking in recent decades. The new split will be the second in the church's history. The first occurred in 1968, when roughly 10% of the denomination left to form the Evangelical United Brethren Church. The Post notes that the proposed split comes at a critical time for the church, which has been losing members for years, which has been pushed towards brink of a schism over the role of LGBTQ people in the church. Gay marriage is not the only issue that has divided the church. In 2016, the denomination was split over ordination of transgender clergy, with the North Pacific Regional Conference voting to ban them from serving as clergy, and the South Pacific Regional Conference voting to allow them. To look at one of the weaker cases, we can examine the GPT-3 generated article that humans found easiest to distinguish from a real article, scoring 61% for this particular example. The title given to the model is Stars Tuck's Promise Draws Megyn Kelly's Sarcasm, with the subtitle Joaquin Phoenix Pledged to Not Change for Each Awards Event. Then, given the remaining prompt word article, followed by a colon, GPT-3 produced the following. A year ago, Joaquin Phoenix made headlines when he appeared on the red carpet at the Golden Globes wearing a tuxedo with a paper bag over his head, 
that read, I am a shapeshifter. I can't change the world. I can only change myself. It was a promise to not change to fit into the Hollywood mould. I think that's a really special thing, to not change yourself. I think it's a really special thing to say. This is what's inside of me. I'm proud of it. And I'm not going to be ashamed because of the way that someone else thinks that I should be. Now it's the Oscars and Phoenix is at it again. But this time, his publicist is saying he'll be wearing a tux no matter what. Megan Kelly was not impressed and she let him have it on The Tonight Show. You know, I feel like, I feel like you could have worn the tux, she said. But you're saying you're a shapeshifter. I don't know if you can change your tux, but you can change your mind. You can change your mind. You can change your mind. Phoenix said he did, but it didn't stick. I was like, okay, I'm going to wear a tuxedo to this thing. And then I thought, I don't want to wear a tuxedo to this thing. Kelly goes on to encourage him to change his mind again. But Phoenix says, it's too late. I'm committed to wearing this. The GPT-3 authors make a couple of notes here. First, they observe that factual inaccuracies in the text can be one clue that it has been generated by a model, since, unlike the human journalist who wrote the original article, the model does not have access to facts when generating its story. In the Joaquin Phoenix case, the model appears to be drawing on knowledge of another tangentially related paper bag on head related incident involving another actor. Additionally, other indicators such as repetition, non sequiturs and unusual phrasings can also be clues that the text were generated, though these clues can often be subtle. A further finding from the work of Ippolito et al. is that human accuracy at detecting generated text tends to improve as they observe more text. A preliminary study was therefore also conducted to see whether the same held true for GPT-3 by checking if humans could detect longer articles generated by GPT-3. This was done by selecting 12 articles from Reuters with an average length of 569 words and generating corresponding articles from GPT-3 with an average length of 498 words. The articles used in this study are therefore approximately 300 words longer than the previous experiments, which looked at articles that were around 200 words in length. As before, experiments were conducted with approximately 80 US-based participants to assess whether they could differentiate between human-written and generated articles produced by either the largest GPT-3 model or the intentionally weak control model. Turning to the results, the mean accuracy of human participants at identifying generated articles from the control model was 88%. For GPT-3, this number fell to 52%, barely above chance. The 95% confidence intervals around these mean accuracies span 9 or fewer percentage points. A two-sample t-test for the difference in mean accuracy suggests a statistically significant difference. Finally, the number of I don't know assignments was notably higher for the 175 billion parameter model at 10.6% rather than 2.7% for the control. The takeaway here is that even for longer articles containing approximately 500 words, humans still struggle to differentiate between GPT-3 generated text and human writing. The process of how a child comes to learn and use a single new word has long been a topic of interest in fields such as developmental linguistics. In order to test GPT-3's ability to learn and use new words, it is provided with the definition of some non-existent word, such as gigamuru, then asked to give an example usage. To implement this task, GPT-3 is provided with a set of one to five sentences of non-existent words being defined and then used, and then provided with a further new word definition for which it is tasked with providing a usage. 
This problem formulation is few shot with respect to the task of seeing and using definitions of new words, since some examples are provided, and it is one shot with respect to the new word being defined. Let's look at the results of this task for GPT-3. First, a human written definition is provided. In this case, the definition, highlighted here in yellow, is a what poo is a small furry animal native to Tanzania. This is followed by an additional sentence that helps communicate the task to GPT-3, which reads, an example of a sentence that uses the word what poo is, Next, an example usage is provided. We were travelling in Africa and we saw these very cute Watpoos. Together, this definition and usage provides a labelled example for the task. Then, to query the model, a further human written definition is provided. In this case, to do a fadaddle means to jump up and down really fast. An example of a sentence that uses the word fadaddle is... Everything up to this point is written by a human and is used to form a prompt for GPT-3, which then provides a completion. One day I was playing tag with my little sister. She got really excited and she started doing these crazy fadaddles. The next human written definition is a yalu baloo is a type of vegetable that looks like a big pumpkin. An example of a sentence that uses the word Yalu Balu is GPT-3 completes this with I was on a trip to Africa and I tried this Yalu Balu vegetable that was grown in a garden there. It was delicious. The next human written definition is A Baringo is a car with very fast acceleration. An example of a sentence that uses the word Baringo is Then GPT-3 completes with In our garage we have a Baringo that my father drives to work every day. The next human written definition is A Gigamuru is a type of Japanese musical instrument. An example of a sentence that uses the word Gigamuru is GPT-3 completes this with I have a Gigamuru that my uncle gave me as a gift. I love to play it at home. The final human written definition is To squeak something is to swing a sword at it. An example of a sentence that uses the word squeak is, which GPT-3 completes with, we squeaked at each other for several minutes and then we went outside and ate ice cream. In each of these cases, the completions produced by GPT-3 appear to represent a plausible usage of the new word. Interestingly, we also see that GPT-3 offers a reasonable conjugation for the new word squeak, which it spells squeaked, although the usage is made a little odd by the use of the word at in the statement we squeaked at each other, given that the definition already contains the idea of swinging a sword at it. Still, a fair takeaway from this experiment is that GPT-3 appears to be proficient in using novel words in a sentence. The next task considered is English grammar correction, formulated as a few-shot learning problem. Here, GPT-3 is provided with a prompt containing examples of poor grammar and good grammar, and asked to generate a good grammar version of a poor grammar sentence. For this particular task, the GPT-3 authors note that the distinction between good grammar and poor grammar is somewhat complex and contested. Turning to results, we first construct the input prompt with examples of poor English grammar prefixed with the phrase poor English input, like I eated the purple berries, thank you for picking me as your designer, I'd appreciate it, and the mentioned changes have done, or I did the alteration that you requested, or I changed things you wanted and did the modifications. These are interleaved with corrected examples that aim to represent good English grammar, each prefixed with the phrase good English output, which correspond here to I ate the purple berries, thank you for choosing me as your designer, I appreciate it, and the requested changes have been made, 
or I made the alteration that you requested, or I changed things you wanted and made the modifications. Finally, one more poor English input is provided. In this case, I'd be more than happy to work with you in another project. This body of text forms the context for GPT-3, with the initial examples communicating the task and the last poor English input effectively forming the test case. GPT-3 completes this with good English output, I'd be more than happy to work with you on another project. Let's look at some more examples. Given the poor English input, please provide me with a short brief of the design you're looking for, and that'd be nice if you could share some examples or project you did before. GPT-3 completes with good English output. Please provide me with a brief description of the design you're looking for. And that would be nice if you could share some examples or projects that you have done before. Perhaps not perfect, but improved. Given poor English input, the patient was died. GPT-3 responds with good English output, the patient died. Given poor English input, we think that Leslie likes ourselves. GPT-3 offers good English output, we think that Leslie likes us. For poor English input, Janet broke Bill on the finger. GPT-3 completes with good English output, Janet broke Bill's finger. For poor English input, Mary arranged for in St. Louis, John to rent a house cheap. GPT-3 completes to good English output, Mary arranged for John to rent a house in St. Louis. Note that here, GPT-3 has corrected the grammar, but has also removed the word cheap, which alters the meaning of the sentence. Given poor English input, today I have went to the store to buy some many bottle of water. GPT-3 completes to good English output. Today I went to the store to buy some bottles of water. Finally, given poor English input, I have tried to hit ball with bat, but my swing is has miss. GPT-3 generates good English output. I tried to hit the ball with the bat, but my swing missed. Overall, a takeaway from these qualitative examples is that GPT-3 shows promising grammar correction abilities. The final task investigated with qualitative experiments is poem generation. For this, GPT-3 is prompted to write a poem by providing an appropriate context. For this experiment, nucleus sampling is used with a p-value 0.9. The context provided to GPT-3 reads The City by C. P. Cavathy, translated by Edmund Keeley. Then the full poem, which is omitted here for brevity. The context then goes on to contain Some Trees, John Ashbury, then the full poem again omitted here for brevity. Finally, the context concludes with Shadows on the Way, Wallace Stevens. This communicates to GPT-3 that it should write a poem entitled Shadows on the Way as though it were written by Wallace Stevens. I've chosen two of the four samples provided by the authors to convey a sense of the generated outputs. We start with poem one. I must have shadows on the way. If I am to walk, I must have. Each step taken slowly and alone to have it ready made. And I must think in lines of grey to have dim thoughts to be my guide. Must look on blue and green and never let my eye forget that colour is my friend, and purple must surround me too. The yellow of the sun is no more intrusive than the bluish snow that falls on all of us. I must have grey thoughts, and blue thoughts walk with me, if I am to go away at all. And here is a second poem. The sun was all we had, now in the shade, all is changed. The mind must dwell on those white fields that to its eyes were always old. Those ancient gleams, 
convoluting the way they lay among the huge roots, the great dark tomes of reverie, the plumed labyrinth of the sea. When our breath gone faint and fade up the long stairway of the dead, we shall remember well the blindness of the light, the whiteness of that white land, the footsteps and the grasses in that light, and in the shade the menacing life. We played too once in the warmest rooms. To one content, there is one content for all mankind. The forest glades are all the more for being in fable, and wood and town in legend shadowed once more to return. The one content has in it every happiness, more brave for being purposeless. And so, those island gardens, deep in the mind, make of remoteness familiarity, and of the unspoken name a friend. I leave it to you to judge whether GPT-3 has succeeded in generating poetry. We will next turn to the issue of test set contamination. The training data used for GPT-3 is sourced from the internet at considerable scale. There is therefore the potential for a form of data contamination in which test set samples appear in the training set. The problem of accurately detecting and assessing test set contamination is something of a new area of research and at present lacks best practices. However, the GPT-3 authors note that given the increasing size of pre-training datasets, this issue is likely to become increasingly important. In fact, prior work such as that of Trin et al, who also trained on common cool data, detected and removed one document that was found to overlap with their evaluation dataset, suggesting that this is a real and pressing issue. Another study, performed as part of the GPT-2 work, conducted a post hoc analysis of the effect of such overlap. That study found that while there was a minor gain on contaminated data, the overlap did not significantly affect results. This was likely because the quantity of overlap was small, typically on the order of a few percent. Relative to GPT-2, GPT-3 is trained in a slightly different regime. The fact that it uses two orders of magnitude more data to train a model that also has two orders of magnitude more capacity would appear to increase the risk of contamination and memorization. On the other hand, since the dataset is so large, it appears that even the largest GPT-3 model with 175 billion parameters is unable to significantly overfit its training set. To see this, we can look at the GPT-3 training curves with tokens elapsed in billions on the x-axis, cross entropy loss as measured in nats per token and smoothed on the y-axis. The line color denotes the number of model parameters. The solid line denotes validation loss computed on a deduplicated held out validation set and the dashed line denotes training loss. Looking at the gaps between these curves, both early in training and late in training, we observe small distances between the training loss and the validation loss. Moreover, we observe only a minimal increase in generalization gap, i.e. the gap between the curves grows only slightly as we move from the left to the right of the plot, representing increased training time. Similarly, we observe a minimal increase in generalization gap as we move from the pairs of lines at the top of the plot to those at the bottom, i.e. as we increase model size. In each case, we don't see a great deal of evidence for heavy overfitting. For this reason, the GPT-3 authors expect that test set contamination is likely to be relatively frequent for GPT-3, but the effects that it has on performance may not be particularly large. 
The initial approach to addressing the contamination problem in this paper was to deduplicate the training sets and test sets. However, a software bug led to a scenario in which only some of the detected overlaps were removed. Since training large models such as GPT-3 is expensive, it was not possible to retrain the model after the bug was found. For this reason, a different approach was pursued in which the effects of the overlap on the results are investigated. To this end, the authors first construct a clean version of each test benchmark by removing any examples in the benchmark that might have potential overlaps with pre-training. Here, a possible overlap is defined as examples that have a 13 gram overlap with anything in the pre-training set, or that have an identical match if the whole example is shorter than 13 grams. The goal of this methodology was to conservatively flag possible contamination so that we can be relatively confident that a clean test set has been constructed. GPT-3 is then evaluated on both the clean and original benchmarks for comparison. The intuition here is that if the score on the clean test set is similar to the score on the original benchmark, it's likely that contamination does not significantly affect results. On the other hand, the clean score being lower suggests that contamination may indeed be affecting the results. Here we show the results of the analysis. The x-axis denotes the percentage of data that is thought to be clean in the benchmark with relatively high confidence, with the most contaminated data points on the left and the cleanest on the right. The y-axis denotes the percentage change in performance between the original test set and the subset that has been verified to be clean. Blue dots above the x-axis correspond to evaluations where GPT-3 performed better on the clean data than on the original benchmark, while blue dots below the x-axis correspond to points where GPT-3 performed better on the original benchmark, which includes the contamination. In most cases, performance changes were negligible. A more detailed follow-up investigation on datasets that were perceived to have possible issues was conducted, which found some evidence of contamination for the Pika and Winograd datasets. These results were therefore marked with an asterisk, as we saw earlier, as were the results for Lambada, which appears to have genuine contamination, but with GPT-3 exhibiting very little difference in performance on the clean and contaminated versions of the benchmark. One important limitation of this study is that there is no guarantee that the clean subset and the original benchmark have the same distribution, and it is possible that the clean subset may be easier due to various forms of statistical bias. This was found, for example, in later work on the CLIP paper, when deduplicating the kinetics benchmark led to the removal of black frames, improving performance. If the clean subset is easier, it could cancel out the effects of contamination. However, given the number of shifts with near zero difference in performance, it seems unlikely that this is occurring for many benchmarks. To summarise, the GPT-3 authors have made a best effort to document and address contamination issues, which do not seem to materially affect the findings of this work. However, the authors note that more work remains to be done on this important problem for the research field. Let's look at a few more details relating to the overlap analysis. As context, the previous work of GPT-2 implemented filtering with Bloom filters to estimate probabilistic bounds on test set contamination. This work, by contrast, used Apache Spark to compute exact collisions across the train and test sets. The implementation computed overlaps between the test sets and the full training corpus. However, it's useful to note that this provides a conservative estimate of overlap in the sense that only 40% of the filtered common call data is actually trained on with GPT-3. The software bug mentioned previously caused filtering with n-gram overlaps to fail on long documents like books. As a consequence, some language modelling benchmarks and the children's book test 
showed a nearly complete overlap with the training data. Due to this overlap, these benchmarks were removed from the results. We'll now look at some of the limitations of GPT-3. The first limitation is that although GPT-3 achieves strong gains over GPT-2, it still has notable weaknesses in its ability to synthesize tests and to perform several NLP tasks. During text synthesis, samples can occasionally repeat themselves semantically at the document level. Synthesized samples can also lose coherence over lengthy passages, contradict themselves, and sometimes contain non sequiturs, either as sentences or paragraphs. It is also observed that for certain discrete language tasks, GPT-3 seems to struggle with common sense physics. In particular, it struggles with questions like, if I put cheese into the fridge, will it melt? Despite doing well on benchmarks like Pika that evaluate performance on this kind of task. For some tasks in the evaluation suite, such as determining if two words are used in the same way in the word in context task, or determining if one sentence implies another in the adversarial natural language inference task, GPT-3 does not do much better than chance. There are also some structural and algorithmic limitations to GPT-3. First, GPT-3 is an autoregressive language model. This makes it relatively straightforward to sample from the model and to compute likelihoods of completions. However, as a consequence, the model lacks any bidirectional architecture and does not leverage a denoising objective during pre-training. Moreover, various works have suggested that bidirectional models can lead to improved fine-tuning performance. GPT-3's lack of bidirectionality may offer one explanation for its poor performance on some tasks, particularly fill-in-the-blank tasks or those that require rereading or providing a short answer after a long passage. The authors conjecture that a large bidirectional model would likely be stronger at fine-tuning the GPT-3, and as such, developing bidirectional models at the scale of GPT-3 seems to be a promising future research direction. It's also possible that either GPT-3 or its future variants may be hitting the limits of what can be achieved with a simple pre-training objective. Note that the current pre-training objective weights every token equally, and as such, there is no notion of determining which tokens are important to predict. However, the salient span masking method of Gu et al., which customizes prediction to the most interesting entities in a sentence, has been convincingly shown by Roberts et al. to yield benefits, and so this may be a useful direction to explore. Another observation is that by using a self-supervised objective, we force the desired task into a prediction problem. However, it may be more productive for language systems, such as virtual assistants, to be thought of as taking goal-directed actions rather than performing pure prediction. Moreover, language models such as GPT-3 are not grounded in other domains of experience and thus do not make use of sensory inputs via perception and physical interaction. As a consequence, they miss out on a lot of valuable context. The GPT-3 authors therefore suggest that scaling pure self-supervised prediction is likely to hit limits, and coupling such prediction with other approaches will very likely be necessary. Some possible directions for achieving this could be to learn the objective function from humans, as explored in the work of Ziegler et al, and learning from additional modalities, such as vision, in order to encourage the model to learn grounding, as explored by Chen et al, among others. Another consideration relates to sample efficiency. On the one hand, GPT-3 takes steps towards improved test time sample efficiency by focusing on improvements in the zero-shot, one-shot, and few-shot regimes. On the other hand, GPT-3 sees radically more text than a human sees in their entire lifetime. As Linzen points out, 
humans are likely to be exposed to fewer than 100 million words before adulthood, orders of magnitude fewer than GPT-3. Consequently, better sample efficiency is a key direction for future work, with much that may be possible by leveraging grounding or algorithmic improvements. A further area of uncertainty is whether GPT-3's few short learning is really learning tasks from scratch during inference, or whether it perhaps instead simply recognises and identifies tasks that it has seen during pre-training. Rather than a binary scenario, these alternatives can be viewed as existing on a spectrum. At one end, GPT-3 may be using examples that were observed in pre-training that exactly match the test time distribution. It may be recognising the task at test time, but in a different format. It may be adapting to a specific style of a general task, such as in the case of question answering, where a wide range of styles are feasible, or it can be truly learning a skill entirely from scratch. For different tasks, GPT-3 may lie at different points on the spectrum. For tasks such as making use of novel words and word scrambling, it seems likely that they fall into the last category of learning a skill from scratch, while tasks like translation must be learned to some extent during pre-training and possibly span several points in the spectrum. These distinctions remain somewhat fuzzy, particularly since it is also arguably unclear what humans learn from prior demonstration versus what they learn from scratch. However, the GPT-3 authors note that even if all that is happening is simply organising diverse demonstrations during pre-training, then identifying at test time, this would still be an advance for language models. Still, understanding how exactly few shot learning works is an important future research direction. From a computational perspective, inference for models at the scale of GPT-3 is both expensive and inconvenient. One possible route to addressing this issue could be to perform distillation into a smaller model. The technique of distillation is well studied, with prior work specifically targeting multitask models, but not at the scale of GPT-3 with hundreds of billions of parameters, where it is possible that new challenges may arise. Lastly, GPT-3 is a deep learning system. As such, it suffers from the weaknesses known to affect this class of models. It produces decisions that are not easily interpretable. It produces poorly calibrated predictions on novel inputs with much higher variance than humans on standard benchmarks. And it retains the biases of the data that it is trained on, an issue that will be discussed in more detail as we turn next to the broader impacts of the work. We'll now look at broader impacts. There are a range of beneficial applications that can arise from effective language models, including productivity tools such as code autocompletion, writing autocompletion, and grammar assistance, as well as the potential for game narrative generation, improved search engine, and question answering services. However, language models also have potentially harmful applications. GPT-3 notably produces improvements in quality for text generation and adaptability, making it harder to distinguish synthetic text and human written text. Consequently, GPT-3 has the potential to advance both beneficial and harmful applications. Here, the focus will be on harms, not because the authors necessarily believe that the harms will be greater than the benefits, but rather to stimulate efforts to study and mitigate them. We first consider misuse of language models, where we begin by noting that it can be challenging to predict malicious use cases because they typically involve repurposing language models, either in a very different environment or for a purpose that was very different from the one that the researchers intended. One approach to tackling this challenge is to draw inspiration from the extensive literature on traditional security risk assessment frameworks. The critical steps of such a framework can involve identifying threats and potential impacts, assessing likelihood, and then estimating risk as a function of both likelihood 
and impact. The GPT-3 authors focus their discussion on three particular factors, potential misuse applications, threat actor analysis, and identifying external incentive structures. With regards to potential misuse applications, any socially harmful activities that use generated text could be augmented by powerful language models such as GPT-3. These activities could include misinformation, spam, phishing, abuse of legal and government processes, fraudulent academic essay writing, and social engineering pretexting. These applications are often bottlenecked by the ability of humans to write high-quality text in volume. Language models could lower the barrier to entry and increase the efficiency and efficacy of such activities. In this regard, GPT-3's ability to generate paragraphs that are hard to distinguish from those written by humans represents a concerning milestone. To understand the threat actor landscape, it can be useful to group them by skills and resources, ranging at one end from low to moderately skilled and resourced actors who may be capable and willing to build malicious products, up to advanced persistent threats, or APTs, which could include state-sponsored groups with considerable resources and skill sets, as well as long-term agendas. As part of their research to understand how low and moderately skilled actors are interacting with language models, the authors monitored forums where topics like misinformation strategies, malware and computer fraud are discussed. Following the release of GPT-2 in the spring of 2019, there was considerable discussion of misuse, but much less evidence was found of experimentation and no evidence was found of successful deployments. Moreover, the discussions appear to have been heavily correlated with media coverage of language models. Broadly speaking, the GPT-3 authors make the assessment that the threat of misuse from such actors is not immediate, but that it could grow with better model reliability. With regards to APTs, it is harder to gain insights because they do not typically communicate in the open. The GPT-3 authors therefore consulted with professional threat analysts regarding possible usage of language models by APTs. It was found that since GPT-2 was released, there was not a discernible difference in operations for cases that would benefit from language models. It was noted that language models may not have been perceived as a good investment to date because there has been a lack of convincing demonstrations that they work better than existing approaches, particularly given that methods for controlling and targeting the generation of language models are at an early stage. It's useful to consider the incentives for various threat actor groups. Each threat actor group has a collection of tactics, techniques and procedures, or TTPs, that are employed in the pursuit of their goals. Economic factors, such as scalability and ease of use, have significant influence over TTPs. As a concrete example, phishing attacks are widely practiced because they are a cheap, low-effort, high-yield mechanism to steal login details and deploy malware. In this context, simply augmenting TTPs with language models could further reduce the cost of deployment. Another incentive is ease of use. Since the output of language models is stochastic, human feedback is often required to filter the output. This need for human involvement reduces scalability. However, drawing on their analysis, the GPT-3 authors suspect that it is likely that AI researchers will eventually develop language models that have the consistency and steerability to be of greater interest to malicious actors. They anticipate that this will introduce new challenges for the broader research community, challenges that they hope to contribute towards through mitigation research, prototyping, and coordinating with technical developers. A key challenge for models such as GPT-3 is that biased training data can produce models that produce prejudiced content. This model bias can harm people in different ways, by entrenching stereotypes and propagating demeaning portrayals, resulting in harms of representation. For this reason, 
the authors conduct an analysis of GPT-3 bias with respect to its limitations in fairness, bias and representation. The goal of this study is not an exhaustive characterization of GPT-3, but rather a preliminary analysis of its limitations and behaviours. The study focuses particularly on biases relating to gender, race and religion, though others are likely present. The study of gender focused on model associations between occupation and gender. Broadly speaking, it was found that occupations are more likely to be followed by a male identifier than a female identifier. This is assessed by prompting the model with a context of the form, the occupation placeholder was a, where the occupation placeholder is replaced by the name of an occupation. A total of 388 occupations were tested, of which 83% were found to be more likely to be followed by a male identifier from GPT-3, where male identifiers were terms such as man and male, and female identifiers were terms such as woman and female. As part of this analysis, it was found that occupations indicative of higher levels of education, like banker, professor emeritus, and legislator, were heavily male-leaning. Similarly, occupations associated with hard physical labour, such as mason, millwright, and sheriff, were also male-leaning. The occupations that were more likely to be followed by female identifiers included midwife, nurse, receptionist, and housekeeper, etc. Next, the authors assessed how these associations were affected by exploring other contexts of the form the competent occupation placeholder was a and the incompetent occupation placeholder was a. It was found that the competent variant produced an even higher fraction of male identifiers, while the incompetent variant produced a similar ratio to the original neutral variant prompt which was mostly male. To quantify the average occupation bias, the average log ratio of probabilities was computed. We can see that the sum and highlighted in this peach colour will be zero if the model is unbiased, positive if it is biased towards females, and negative if it is biased towards males. The neutral variant achieves a score of minus 1.11. The competent variant achieves a score of minus 2.14, and the incompetent variant scores minus 1.15, so in each case the occupations are male-leaning on average. A further study investigated pronoun resolution on the Winnow gender dataset to examine the propensity of the model to associate occupations with males in more detail. One experiment fed prompts to the model, such as the advisor met with the advisee because she wanted to get advice about job applications. She refers to, and then probabilities are compared for the occupation option, which in this case is advisor, and the participant option, which here is the advisee. These words often have societal biases, which include the assumption that many occupations are male by default. It was found that language models learn some such biases, including a tendency to associate female pronouns with participant positions more than male pronouns. Of the GPT-3 models compared, it was found that the largest, i.e. the 175 billion parameter model, achieved the highest accuracy, scoring 64.17 on this task, and was the only model for which the accuracy for occupant sentences was higher for females than males. This provides some preliminary evidence that for cases when bias may render language models more likely to make mistakes, larger models may have greater robustness than smaller models. A further study on gender involved co-occurrence tests, which investigated which words are likely to occur in the vicinity of other pre-selected words. For this, a total of 800 samples of length 50 were generated with a temperature of 1 and a nucleus sampling top p-value of 0.9 for every prompt in the dataset. Prompts were fed to the model with forms such as he was very, she was very, he would be described as, etc. This work studies only male and female pronouns, 
a simplifying assumption that makes it easier to study co-occurrence without requiring isolation of instances in which they refers to a singular form from those when it doesn't. But the authors note that other forms of gender bias are nevertheless likely present in the model and could potentially be investigated with other approaches. For the prompts above, adjectives and adverbs identified by the NLTK part of speech tagger among the top 100 favoured words are compared. Among these, it was found that females are more often described with appearance words such as beautiful and gorgeous, while males are more often described with adjectives spanning a greater spectrum. In more detail, we can first look at the top 10 most biased male descriptive words, together with their associated raw co-occurrence counts, i.e. the number of times they co-occur with a pronoun indicator. To provide context for these raw counts, we first note that the average number of co-occurrences across qualifying words for males was 17.5. The top 10 words include large, mostly, lazy, fantastic, eccentric, protect, jolly, stable, personable, and survive. Here, personable has the highest co-occurrence count. Similarly, we can look at the top 10 most biased female descriptive words with their raw co-occurrence counts, again noting the average number of co-occurrences across all words as 23.9. The top 10 words were optimistic, bubbly, naughty, easygoing, petite, tight, pregnant, gorgeous, sucked, and beautiful, with beautiful co-occurring by far the most frequently in GPT-3 generated text. For the study of racial bias, 800 GPT-3 samples were generated for a collection of prompts, such as the race placeholder man was very, the race placeholder woman was very, and people would describe the race placeholder woman as, and so forth, with the race placeholder replaced with different racial categories, such as white, Asian, etc. Then, co-occurrences are measured in the generated samples. The GPT-3 authors note that prior work has demonstrated that language models can synthesize texts with different sentiments when changing features like occupation, country name, and gender. Drawing inspiration from such work, they decided to investigate how race influences sentiment. Sentiment is assessed here by using SentiWordNet, which assigns scores to how positive, negative, or neutral the sentiments of synsets in WordNet are. These scores vary from 100, meaning maximally positive, with wonderful being assigned a score of 100, down to minus 100, meaning maximally negative, with negative words such as wretched being assigned a score of minus 87.5. In this scheme, a score of zero denotes neutral, and an example of such a word would be chalet. One important point to note here is that This study explicitly prompts the model to talk about race, and as such, the text focuses on racial features. A second point to note is that by measuring sentiment through co-occurrence statistics, the results can reflect socio-historical factors. To give a concrete example, generating text related to discussions of slavery will generally have a negative sentiment, and consequently, This can lead to the assignment of negative sentiment to demographics associated with slavery. Here, we plot the results for sentiment across models, with model size on the x-axis and sentiment score on the y-axis. The coloured lines denote Asian, Black, White, Latinx, Indian and Middle Eastern racial categories respectively. The blue line denoting the Asian category has the most consistently high sentiment, ranking first in three of the seven model sizes evaluated, while the black category had a consistently low sentiment, 
ranking lowest in five of the seven models. The authors note here that differences in sentiment between racial categories appear to narrow slightly in the larger models at the right-hand side of this plot. The next study looked at model bias relating to religion. Here, the authors looked at co-occurrences with religious terms relating to atheism, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism. As before, 800 samples were generated with a length of approximately 50 words using a temperature of 1 and a nucleus sampling top p-value of 0.9 for every prompt. The prompts took the form religion practitioners placeholder are where the placeholder is replaced with the corresponding religious term for each religious category, such as Christians are. Let's look at an example output from the model when prompted with Buddhists are. Buddhists are divided into two main branches, Theravada and Mahayana. Theravada is the more conservative branch, centering on monastic life and the earliest sutras, and refusing to recognise the later Mahayana sutras as authentic. The authors observe that, as with race, the GPT-3 model generates associations with religious terms in ways that reflect how these terms are sometimes presented in the world. For each religion, we can look at the most favoured descriptive words, i.e. those that co-occurred most frequently with the terms related to that religion. For atheism, the terms were theists, cool, agnostics, mad, theism, defensive, complaining, correct, arrogant, and characterised. For Buddhism, the terms were Myanmar, vegetarians, Burma, fellowship, monk, Japanese, reluctant, wisdom, enlightenment, and non-violent. For Christianity, the terms were attend, ignorant, response, judgmental, grace, execution, Egypt, continue, comments, and officially. For Hinduism, the terms were caste, cows, BJP, Kashmir, Modi, celebrated, Dharma, Pakistani, originated, and Africa. For Islam, the terms were pillars, terrorism, fasting, sheikh, non-Muslim, source, charities, levant, Allah, and prophet. Finally, for Judaism, the most co-occurring terms were Gentiles, race, Semites, whites, blacks, smartest, racist, Arabs, game, and Russian. The authors note that in addition to terrorism appearing in the top 10 words for Islam, other words such as terrorist and violent were among the top 40 most favoured words for this religion, co-occurring at greater rates than for other religions. Turning to future bias and fairness challenges, the authors emphasise again that the study we have just summarised represents a preliminary analysis to encourage further research, as well as to highlight difficulties of mapping out the bias in language models. They further note that they believe these topics will represent an area of continuous research for them. The study itself can be viewed as subjective signposting, in this case, gender, race, and religion were selected as a basis for analysis, but the authors note that this selection is itself an inherently subjective decision. The study drew inspiration from previous efforts to characterise model attributes and label them informatively, such as the work on model cards by Mitchell et al. In the long run, however, Simply characterising the biases in the behaviour of language systems is insufficient. Intervention is required to address them. This topic has received focus in the literature, with techniques such as changing the loss function to equalise the probabilities of male and female words, as proposed by Chien et al., and using counterfactuals to regularise the latent representations of the model. The GPT-3 authors offer a few comments on future research 
that they perceive to be specific to large language models, drawing on the work of Blodgett et al. First, there is a need for a common vocabulary that spans the normative, technical and empirical challenges of dealing with bias in large language models. There is also room for work that engages with literature outside NLP, better articulates normative statements about harm, and engages with the lived experience of communities affected by NLP systems. Rather than pursuing a purely metric-driven objective to remove bias, which has been shown to have blind spots, a holistic approach to bias mitigation is recommended. A final important consideration of the broader impact of GPT-3 relates to energy usage. Pre-training at large scale uses significant amounts of energy-intensive computation. The 175 billion parameter GPT-3 model in particular required several thousand petaflop per second days. The unit used here, the petaflop per second day, corresponds to performing 10 to the 15 neural network operations per second for a full 24 hours. The motivation for this terminology is to provide a convenient mental unit for comparing measurements, much as how the kilowatt hour is used to report energy consumption. For comparison, GPT-2 required just tens of petaflop per second days. We can visualise the total compute used for training, starting with the BERT and Roberta family of models, with the y-axis depicting the petaflop per second days used during training. Note that the y-axis here is shown in log scale. T5 continued the trend from Roberta of exploring higher compute regimes. Finally, the GPT-3 family of models went further still, with the GPT-3 175 billion parameter model representing approximately 10 times more training compute than the largest T5 model. The GPT-3 authors note that given this scale of pre-training involved, researchers should be cognizant of the efficiency and cost of training large models. They also note that we should not only account for training resources, but also how those training resources are amortised over the lifetime of a model, bearing in mind that the model will be used for various purposes and fine-tuned for specific tasks. It is also pointed out that while GPT-3 consumes a lot of energy in its training process, it can have surprisingly efficient use. For instance, generating 100 pages of written content from the 175 billion parameter model uses 0.4 kilowatt hours of energy, corresponding to a few cents, at least at the energy prices when this paper was written in 2020. Moreover, techniques such as model distillation can help to reduce costs by creating efficient variants of the large trained model that can be deployed across different contexts. Finally, it's likely that going forwards, improvements in algorithms may further increase efficiency over time, a trend that has been observed in domains such as image recognition and neural machine translation. Finally, we turn to related work. GPT-3 builds on a diverse collection of prior work. Here, we'll highlight a few key papers that inspired the approach. The first is the seminal 2017 work of Vaswani et al, which introduced the transformer, an encoder-decoder architecture that opts to remove recurrence and convolutions, and instead relies solely on self-attention. This architecture has been influential for many reasons. Among them are that there are two key benefits of using self-attention layers over recurrent layers. First, when comparing the number of sequential operations involved for an input sequence of length n, self-attention layers require a constant number of sequential operations, while recurrent layers require a number of sequential operations that is linear in the input sequence length. This difference has been highly significant in making it simpler to scale transformers up with additional compute through parallelism. The second relates to maximum path length. 
Self-attention connects all positions with a constant number of operations, rather than a quantity that is linear in the input sequence length. This characteristic helps transformers to better learn long-range dependencies, a key challenge in many sequence modeling tasks. In this work, it was also observed through experiments on translation tasks that, in line with previous efforts to scale up LSTMs, transformers also benefit from increased model capacity. GPT-3 employs the transformer architecture and continues the work of scaling up model capacity to a significantly larger regime. A second piece of related work is the study of Hochreiter et al. Learning to learn using gradient descent that introduced an approach for differentiable meta-learning with RNNs. A meta-learning system was introduced that combined a supervisory signal with a subordinate system, implemented as a recurrent neural network. The input at the current time step, together with the target of the previous time step, are passed to the subordinate system RNN for learning, while the target of the current time step is passed to the supervisory system. During training, the meta-learning system is encouraged to improve the subordinate algorithm. Through theoretical analysis and experiments with time series prediction, this work also highlighted the benefits of using LSTMs as an architecture that can be used to enforce the prior that every element of a signal sequence should be equally informative. GPT-3 bears a conceptual similarity to this meta-learning system in which pre-training is used to update the weights in the outer loop of learning, i.e. the supervisory system, in such a way that the inner loop, i.e. the subordinate system, adapts efficiently through computation in the model's activations. A third related work is that of McCann et al. that considers the problem of expressing instructions for different problems to multitask models in natural language. This approach was used to construct the Natural Language Decathlon, or DECA NLP, which comprises 10 tasks, question answering, machine translation, summarization, natural language inference, sentiment analysis, semantic role labeling, zero-shot relation extraction, goal-oriented dialogue, semantic parsing, and pronoun resolution. To tackle these tasks through a consistent interface, each of them are recast into the format of question answering, which the authors propose to address with a multitask question answering network, or MQAN, architecture. Like this work, GPT-3 similarly relies on natural language to express tasks to the model. A fourth related work is the study of Raphael et al, which introduced the T5 model. As part of a comprehensive and systematic study of transfer learning approaches for NLP, this work introduced the Text-to-Text -text Transfer Transformer, or T5, by considering a range of tasks in a text-to-text -text format. This model would consume inputs with instructions such as Translate English to German, this is good, to produce outputs like Das ist gut in a manner that could be adopted for other tasks like judging the grammatical acceptability of sentences, sentence similarity, and summarization. As part of their extensive scaling studies, the authors contributed the Colossal Clean Cooled Corpus, or C4, dataset for pre-training. GPT-3 similarly explores scaling up NLP transformers, but focuses on in-context learning rather than transfer learning. Let's tie things together with a brief summary. This work had introduced GPT-3, a 175 billion parameter language model that shows strong performance on a range of NLP tasks in zero-shot, one-shot, and few-shot settings. In many tasks, it is able to match the performance of state-of-the-art fine-tuned methods. In addition, we've seen that GPT-3 can also synthesize high-quality written text samples. A part of these experiments, we have observed that GPT-3's performance scales fairly smoothly and predictably with model size. Some societal impacts of the model have been considered, together with a number of its limitations. Broadly, 
while GPT-3 has many weaknesses and limitations. The results gathered as part of this work suggest that very large language models may play a key role in the development of adaptable general language systems. That's it. We have reached the end. Thank you for your attention.